Happy Sabbath. Um, welcome, welcome. Uh, Uncle Liz is joining us. Happy Sabbath, welcome. Okay, so this week we are on chapter 15 of the book, The Great Controversy, and we are so glad. Um, if you've been joining us throughout the entire series, then you stuck around for a while. If not, that's fine. You can still catch up on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. <laughs> we upload the same content, so there's no problem. You just get the same videos. Um, okay, so we're on chapter 15, but before we begin, I'm going to ask Uncle Lee to give us a word of prayer. Yeah, let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I'd like to thank you this afternoon for giving us a chance yet again to discuss your word and to discuss history, to see how it applies to us uh, in these days. May you please open our hearts and even our minds so that whatever we are going to learn can help us in our preparation for a second coming. When all is said and done, may we be found uh, faithful waiting for a second coming. Pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, Shingi. Happy Sabbath. Um, thank you for joining us live. Um, alrighty. So, this is quite an interesting chapter. And I think people who studied history, be it A level or O level, um, or even university, will really enjoy um, this chapter. And those that are historians, out of interest, of course. We don't want to leave you out. So the topic is the Bible and the French Revolution. In this chapter, we are given an indication of how John, God reveals to John what would happen in the future. And this is done um, and then shared with us when the book of Revelation, chapter 11, specifically is written. So chapter 11, verse 2 to 11 and 12, practically talks about the French Revolution. And this is the climax of chaos in France, of course, with the exception that with, of the time of travel that's going to come. But this is like the climax of chaos because a lot of things have been happening to build up the tension that just explodes between 1789 to 1799. Mm -hmm. So um, the French, from the French Albigians, who were denying God, we have an ongoing series in the 1600s. We have um, the religious wars that are fought, where we have um, the most, it says the world remembers with shuddering water. The massacre at St. Bartholomew, okay? So this happens um, in the 16th century, and people are slaughtered. They die mercilessly. And now, after a number of years, the society itself has um, abandoned inequalities. The ruling class, the noblemen, and the clergy enjoy a vast number of um, freedoms that... Uh, denied the middle class and the peasantry. So this really causes a number of problems. And remember, during this period, which in the Bible is also referred to as the 1260 days or years, um, the Bible is denied to the people. But the Bible is denied specifically by um, the Catholic Church, right? Mm -hmm. So at this point, France is not exempt from this denial. So the Bible is being read scarcely in France, and um, you then have these inequalities coming into play. So this itself causes some terrible darkness, such that it says that Louis the Fifteenth, before Louis the Sixteenth, actually said, you know what? Don't worry about anything. Just make sure that people are stable until I get out of power. Mm -hmm. And then once I'm out of power, whatever happens will have happened. So you can imagine the situation that was there. So by the time Louis the Sixteenth, um, who is the king by the time the revolution um, breaks out, is in power, there's chaos already. And so Louis is ruling, but he marries a very extravagant wife who's 
name is Marie Antoinette. So she is spending tons of money on things. And this is just adding on to the situation of a community that has no Bible. And then you're doing nonsensical things. So these are people who think they're elevated. They can reason. They know their rights. So they're going to have a revolution. So this happens. Initially, the revolution is really targeted on um, people that hold specific religious beliefs. And they're saying, no, the Catholic Church has been doing this for a long time. Why are the clergy, which are the bishops and everything, having all these advantages, yet common people are being denied access to them? They had land. Why are common people not getting land? Um, they're exempt from certain taxes. Why is the burden of taxes on the people? So they're like, no, we're going to fight the Catholic Church. It's, in fact, anything church-related is nonsense. So they fight, and there's an uprising. And then in the year 1793... A law is then passed that says we will not worship God. In fact, there is no God. The only God that you believe in is a God that you have created in your mind. We are doing away with that God. We want to worship the goddess of reason. So Chosen is an opera dancer. She used to sing and dance. She was very beautiful. And she's chosen to be the representation of a goddess. So she comes in half-dressed and she's clothed with a crown and she has a symbol of the sun which i was telling uncle leaves that it's very very interesting nonetheless this goddess comes in and she's paraded the nation at large says ah yes we are happy the leading bishop of the country is called into the national assembly and he actually denounces his faith and says you know what everything i was teaching you about religion those were lies those are things that i was making up in my head with the other priests there's nothing like that. So France as an entire nation denies God. And the legislative assembly then puts it into law to say, no, we as the French people have agreed that there's no God. We won't worship God. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Sorry, we were having network challenge. The three and a half days, spoken of in Revelations chapter 11, is the three and a half days. So please don't mistake this with the time, times, and half a time. Um, I was mistaken. No, I wasn't mistaken, it, but I was getting confused to say what is the distinction. So now we have the three and a half years that are three and a half days that are spoken of, which represent the three and a half years mm -hmm. from 1793, right? So from 1793, the Bible now is completely banned. People are being killed. Um, actually, there's a, a statement that was saying you'd not walk four paces and not stumble across a dead body. It was that bad. So people, there were just dead bodies all over and people were dying. Happy Sabbath, mommy. Happy Sabbath, mommy. No mvuyo. Welcome. So um, this is how bloody France was. And then um, in 1797, due to the chaos, so the Jacobins are ruling... And then the Jacobins begin to now mercilessly slaughter people. So Louis is the one who is first um, slaughtered on the guillotine. Marie Antoinette follows a number of people who were non-sympathetic um, to the revolution were also killed. And then Robespierre leads this and he then is also killed at the guillotine. So people notice that now it's just senseless killing. Senseless in every sense. People are just being killed mm -hmm. and it doesn't make sense. And so they think, mm -mm, there's a problem. We need to return back to the Bible. And so in 1797, you have the Bible being reintroduced, religious liberty being granted to a certain extent. And then in 1797, in 1798, which is where the 1,260-year period ends, the Pope is arrested by an army which was sent by Napoleon Bonaparte. And he then dies in exile. So the Pope that follows thereafter really is um, not in the truest sense a political leader. His power is just limited to um, his religious authority. So this is the summary of what happened. So you have influential people during the revolution, the likes of Voltaire. Voltaire actually says, bluntly says, I'm tired of hearing people speaking about the fact that Christianity was founded by 12 men, I will show them that one man can destroy them, can destroy it. So, you know, this is quite an interesting thing that you have these philosophies coming into play. Then you have, of course, the rise, the rise of human rights. So while in law school, we were doing the lesson on human rights, and I saw the picture of the 
tablets of the human rights i was looking for it and then i saw and i thought it was quite interesting then i also saw another presentation that had the same um tablets of stone it's interesting to think that the rights the human rights were written on a tablet of stone a symbol of the ten commandments as well but that's a story for another day so this happens and the revolution comes to an end really serving to show that you know nothing can be done without the word of god and without the presence of the holy spirit but that's the summary of um chapter 15. Sidi, would you like to add anything or should we get into it um i think we can just start um, okay and i will take the first two quotations um the first quotation comes from the first paragraph. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. We are reading John 3, verse 19. Mm. The nation was left to reap the results of the course which she had chosen. The restraint of God's spirit was removed from a people that had despised the gift of his grace. Evil was permitted to come to maturity, mm -hmm. and all the way world saw the fruit of willful rejection of the light. There's a verse in the Bible in John chapter 3 verse 19 that I read. The verse what, is, what it's saying is light actually came to this world. Mm -hmm. Light was sent, Jesus came, a lot of preachers were sent. We can see it even in these days. That light keeps on coming to our doors, to our hearts. But people will reject it. Mm -hmm. That was the same thing that happens in France. If you've been following before, we were talking even about reformers who were preaching, moving from country to country. Even in France, some of them were chased away. Um, and they rejected light. Mm -hmm. So when you reject light, you start by rejecting. I, I think all of us, because we are, are born of sin, we have experienced some sinful acts where you see that, ah, you just say, today I'll just do this one bad thing. But the more you resist to that one small thing, you see yourself doing even bigger things. Mm -hmm. So that is what happened in France. On a small scale, people just doing whatever they want. And it ended up being a national thing. Up to an extent, like Mara mentioned, that where they declare that, no, you know what, there is no God. We are just going to live using our own liberty. but you just have to pray. Uh, what's important is our own uh, freedom. And if you look into these days, Slowly and slowly, people are resisting the light of God. Mm -hmm. A lot of things are happening. Some of them we will mention. People are resisting. Some things which you used to think, ah, you know, this would never happen. Mm -hmm. These days, you just look and say, ah, oh, okay. And we are just getting used to it. And that's what happened here. And at the end of the day, they ended up revolting, killing each other. And um, as we will see at the end of the chapter, they ended up... Um, deciding to say you know what let's go back to the bible so we shouldn't in our small spheres even if you are raising your own children in your family as a as a family take time to go back to the word of god mm -hmm. don't resist light as families what the consequences you might not see them today but in future and when it happens now it will be too hard to reverse and you won't even uh sometimes you won't say right Really sorry, you know, it reminds me of the quote that I'm actually supposed to comment on. The sentence that Uncle Leaves was saying, the quotation is saying that the nation was left to reap the results of the course which she had chosen. They had chosen this course as a nation, and everyone in the nation was affected, right? So it says, the quote that I was reading says that when bad things begin to happen, it is the devil's tactic to then place blame on God. Yet, this is because of a course that you have chosen. If there is light and there is darkness, then you choose to walk on a dark path and you stumble on a stone and, a, and fall. You can't say, God, you have left me. Why did you allow me to fall? Because it's not his fault. As human beings, we tend to want to blame God when bad things happen as a result of the decisions that we have made. But God places before us light and darkness and leaves the choice unto us so may we always make the right decision to say we will choose something and should we choose wrong and bad happens we should not um in the following pages okay um you know there is something interesting about uh prophecy uh may god help us god has tried to do what he can to give us prophecy just to prove that 
everything that ha that's happening in this world will come to an end. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming very soon. And, you know, whatever we do on this uh, world, one thing that we should... Um, okay, I'll continue. So, what I was saying is, God has tried to tell us what's going to happen in future and what has happened before. And if we look, like Mara mentioned, some of these things were prophesied um, in Revelation chapter 11, verse uh, from verse two, actually the whole chapter. And here in the Great Controversy, they quote from verse 2 to 11. There are two uh, deaths which are mentioned. The, one, the other one is um, the 12, 60 years. And uh, in Revelation chapter 11, they are mentioned as 42 months. And these years are the years when... Um, the Roman Catholic Church was trying to suppress the word of God so that it doesn't reach to people. And I think we've been learning about that, where the reformers were persecuted uh, and a lot of things were happening. Mm -hmm. And the other text is the three and a half years which you mentioned, where the two witnesses, these two witnesses being the first and Old Testament, uh, the Old and the New Testament, uh, the, word of the, the word of God. And um, I think I'll, I'll read it here. Um, the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months, and I'll give power unto my witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. So for one thousand two hundred and sixty years, these witnesses were still prophesying, mm -hmm. though they were difficulties, persecution, and stuff. But at, towards the end now, where the um, French Revolution, uh, French uh, revolution comes in. That's when we see these two witnesses being killed. But after they are killed, they are killed for three and a half years and people are happy and they say, ah, you know what, we are done with these witnesses. That's when the, uh, the people from France celebrated saying we are destroying the Bible, they burned the Bible and they said, no, it's not coming. But later on, we see the Bible coming on after three and a half years. And if you look at it, all this was written in the Bible before the French Revolution. Mm. God had warned us. There are a lot of things that are happening right now which God had forewarned us. Sometimes we ignore or sometimes we think that we still have time to do whatever we want. But one thing that we should always remember is when judgment comes or when these final times come, we might not have enough time to prepare our souls or to change our characters so that they can fit uh, the second coming all so that they can fit for heaven. Uh, we'll move on to the next quotation by Mark. Oh, okay. Um, I thought you had one thing. That's fine. You know, I wanted to touch on something sweet mm. that I found very interesting to say that um, the two witnesses were given power. Mm. So within the period of the 1260 years, these witnesses had power, mm. but they were being killed. I found that to be very striking to say they had power. And it reminded me of Revelation chapter 18, where it says that um, the angel in Revelation chapter 18 comes with great power, mm -hmm. with great power. So which is now believed to say the latter rain will have fallen upon the people and they have power. Mm -hmm. It does not negate the killing or the dying or the persecution of God's people. Mm -hmm. In fact, power is needed to strengthen them working, preparing for the death that is to come. Of course, with the exception of the 144,000, they are going to live. But when the Holy Spirit gives us power, I've heard many people who want to leave churches because a loved one has died, they were praying about it, then they're like, ah, no, this church doesn't have power, it doesn't have, no. When power comes, it strengthens you for persecution. Mm. The presence of power ensures that you endure persecution. Mm. And so the two witnesses have power. Hence, they are preaching with power, but in self-cloth. Whatever you're going through, it might be because you actually are anointed with the power of God. And you should be a witness in self-cloth. You have power. All you need to do is accept and say, okay, I have power. Lord, what do you want me to do? If it means that I'm going to need to die in the next three months, that's fine. But I know you've given me power. I'm going to witness in the same clothes that I have. And so I just thought about that and thought I should share. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I have the next one, which is saying that 
all who exalt their own opinions above the revelation, all who would change the plain meaning of scripture to suit their own convenience or for the sake of conforming to the world, are taking upon themselves a fearful responsibility. The written word, the law of God, will measure the character of every man and condemn all whom this unerring test shall declare wanting. Hmm. Oh, okay, but what I say is small habits end up building. Indeed, that's mm. very true. That's very true. They end up building the char- our characters. May God help us. You know, this quotation that I'm reading is interesting in that it's saying, oh, regardless of who you are, are you a teacher who's teaching people that the law of God no longer matters? Are you just a church member who is telling others that ah, the law of God doesn't matter as hard? Why should we even be doing this? Or oh, the word of God. Mm. It said that um, the written word, comma, the law of God will measure the character of every man and condemn all whom this unerring <laughs> guys take note of the words unerring test shall declare one thing so it says that when judgment comes the measure for testing our characters is going to be the written word of god and the law of god and this unerring test will reveal everyone who is found wanting within this test. Mm-hmm. It's very simple for you to say, no, people at church are judgmental. People where are judgmental. But remember that there's an unerring test that comes. It might be justified to say, liberty judges me, but I know his weakness. If he has no right, that's fine. But the Bible has no fault. Mm-hmm. There's no wanting in it to say, ah, so maybe there was a mistake with the measurements or the judgment, or I can appeal. I actually wrote something that was saying um, the courts of heaven have no court of appeal. When a judgment is made in the magistrate's court and you don't like it, you say, I'll go to the high court. If the high court says something you don't like it, you say, I'll go to the Supreme Court. If it's a constitutional matter, you then say, you know what, I'll go to the constitutional court. And then maybe the judgment might actually change. But when it's the court of heaven, when it's the unerring court that decides, there is no court of appeal. And so there's a verse that I read from John chapter 12, verse um, 48, and it was saying, it says rather, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. So it's saying that <laughs> Jesus is the one who was talking here. So this is where um, the, the Greeks had come to Jesus and also the Pharisees, but they were denying that he is really the Christ. And then Jesus says, you know what, guys, it's okay. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one that shall judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. So Jesus is saying, I am God. I have spoken these words. But don't worry, if you don't want to believe him, you have one who shall judge you. And they thought, oh, okay, God shall judge us. And then he says, the same words that I have spoken shall judge you. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So I ask you today, who has given Ellen White the words that she has spoken to us? Who has given us, who has given John the Revelator the words that he has spoken? Who gave God or Jesus the word in Luke 4 verse 16 that on the seventh day he went to the synagogue as was his custom? Was that something that he thought out of his head and said, okay, I've said this, but I'm going to change my word. Does the Bible not say God is the same today, yesterday, today, and forevermore? Therefore, can his words change? Did his, did his words change just because now he has gone to heaven and he says, okay, um, the Sabbath has been brought, brought in disrepute? Um, the way you take care of your body doesn't matter. You don't have an obligation to do so anymore. Has the Lord changed? If he has not, and we agree that his word stays forever, we are being told here that there is one who shall judge us in the end. And this one is the one that has spoken the very word. So if anything, if the people at church or the community around you annoys you, 
that's fine. Let go of them. Don't worry. But just follow what the word of God says. And in doing so, you will learn to love your enemies. But that's fine. So this is really just what I wanted to say. That may God help us. Are we leaders in church? Are we church members? May God help us not to put make not of the word of God. And so now I'm moving on to the next connectation, which is saying intimately connected with these laws affecting religion was that which reduced the union of marriage the most sacred engage, engagement which human, being, which human beings can form and the permanence of which leads mostly to the consolidation of society to the state of a mere civil contract of a transitory character which any two persons might engage in and cast loose at pleasure I was telling the babies that it was reduced to just being a pair of shoes or a handbag. To say marriage is what you choose. To say, oh, this Sabbath, I want to go with this handbag. Then you choose this loving husband. Then next week you're like, ah, I'm tired of this guy. Look at his beard. Then you choose the next person. This is how much marriage was reduced. And so this happened in 1793. And with the introduction of, um, rather, making light of the marriage covenant, People could just get in and out as they pleased. Mm -hmm. Now we do know that families are the what that binds society. Mm -hmm. The the weaves that bind society and ensure that we raise. You know, it's it's it happens that people due to certain circumstances might need to be raised by single parents. I was raised by a single mom. Um and these are things that happen in life. But generally, and not in an ideal world, generally what would happen is that you have a, a concrete family that has a father and a mother, God allowing. And should there be children, that's fine too. Studies have shown over and over again that people who grow up in a family like this, where God is feared, of course, grow up with a better um, outlook on life. They have less chances of being... Um, castrated and everything right so once you destroy that unit and your dad can have a girlfriend whenever he pleases your mom has married to this man then tomorrow she's married to the next imagine the impact it has on the child that's growing what the child thinks about marriage i'll read your quotation here oh Siri, you're meant to do the next one hmm. but anyway i'll read your quotation from adventist home which is saying Christ came not to destroy this institution, the marital institution, but to restore to it its original sanctity and elevation. He came to restore the moral image of God in men, and he began his work by sanctioning marriage relation. So Christ came back... Um, to restore the moral image of God in men. And he said in order to bring about the moral image of God in men. To restore the fallen image which Adam had lost. To bring it back there has to be a marriage. I have to find a helpmate for this man. To restore the moral image of God. So by deduction to remove the moral image of God. What had to be attacked? Excellent. Marriage. Marriage had to be attacked. So in a bid to remove the image of God, whether the legislators knew or not, the devil had his effect. In fact, it says that the same way God was the invisible leader of the Israelites in their journey from Egypt, the devil was the invisible leader of the revolution. So if God had said to bring about my moral image in people, I will use marriage. To fight that, the devil also said, I'm going to use marriage. And so this is what happened, sadly. And one HS actually says, ah, it was just a cover-up for adulterous relationships because the things that people were doing were really just unimaginable. And so um, that's it, sweetie. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, you see similar things. I, I okay. Don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so we're discussing with Uncle Libs. On the attack that is happening in marriages right now mm. to say the institution of marriages is being yeah. fought exactly no. Ubuduake is saying the devil is fighting families now more than ever that's true mm. and i think buddhi if you remember i actually mentioned when we did the issue of um relationships when i was saying that he fights marriages and he can fight 
fight them from the very inception. First, he can try to make avoid a marriage to happen that would work for the kingdom, right? If he sees that, ah, okay, so I can't buy a marriage from Okeri, he makes sure that you are yoked to a person who will buy you from having the image of God reproduced in you. So your partner is going to make it impossible for you to have the image of God reproduced in you. That's number two. Say you both might try to have the image of God reproduced in you. Nothing might then come in between you. And then, because nothing has come, the marriage is dissolved. Never mind, we can't even begin to talk about the movements that are being introduced right now. The non-binary <laughs> movement being the latest... Um, Trans, uh, yeah, I told the kids that I wasn't going to Whoa. talk about it because of the rules that are on social media. I'm not sure about them, but we know these movements that are going on right now. And the devil is trying so much to attack the institution of marriage. You know, I want to tell you of how when the punishment was given to Adam and Eve, if you remember, actually if you remember that Eve was to see the image of God through Adam. Mm. It was not a mad image of God because he hadn't sinned. But um, mm, 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 mm. sure, Jay-Z is saying these movements are scary. My sister, I concur. It's alarming. You know, you're, you're wondering where are we going? It's mind blowing. You can't imagine life in the next 10 years. Later on, five years, even three years for now, guys, I'm trying to imagine when your kids start going to preschool, what type of things they'll be learning. Mm. Lord have mercy on us we need to go home so anyway uncle Liz was going to say something i just thought i should mention that before he says something i think you have said it you know that marriage these days even the people whom the society regard as like uh celebrities or role models the picture they are giving us is at the end of the day marriage is nothing you can just walk out of it it's not something that you can just look up to when we were still young we know we would actually talk the girls who talk about they would well, they wanted marriage so much but the people who live in society they are giving this picture that they, that's nothing that you can look up to um i don't know how to say it really but the devil is not coming like in the french revolution to say uh maybe the regulators or the the leaders will say marriage is nothing or the bible is nothing he's just influencing us in the in our day-to-day -day lives mm -hmm. that we are just declaring it through our actions to say you know what this is nothing mm -hmm. but the results are the same yeah. whether we have declared but if we are going to live as if what god has created <clears> or <throat> what god has blessed is nothing then it means we are rejecting the light of god mm -hmm. and the end result is the same and uh, we will see some of the things um they, there's a quotation that mara had Charmed, but I, I'll just read it. I think we mentioned it earlier. Plenty of blasphemers, plenty of infidels. There have been and still continue to be in England, Germany, Spain, and elsewhere. But France stands apart in the world's history as the single state which, by the decree of the Hell Legislative Assembly, pronounced that there was no God, and of which the entire population of the capital and the vast majority elsewhere women as well as men danced and sang with joy in accepting the announcement i think i mentioned it earlier to say people were actually happy and this was said uh, in revelation chapter 11 where the bible said people were happy when the two witnesses uh, were killed which was the old uh, and the new testament uh, i'll go on to to my next quotation uh, then mara will come to here when she's back um in strict justice, they are to be charged upon the church. Popery had poisoned the minds of kings against the Reformation. As an enemy to the crown, an element of discord that would be fatal to the peace and harmony of the nation. It was the genius of Rome that by this means inspired the direct cruelty and the most galling oppression which proceeded from the throne. Uh, what this is saying is, you know, earlier, uh, when the, the, the nations were fighting the Reformation, they thought, yeah, we're just fighting, and they were being influenced, influenced by the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church thought it was just uh, a fight against the Reformers. 
But the results now are these where the nation ended up saying, you know what, I think you are right. We are just going to do away with everything that has to do with Christianity. And what were the results? The killing of the people uh, and the killing of the, those who would preach the word of God. And so what am I saying to us at this moment? You know, there are times when we pass some comments against the word of God. Mm. We pass some negative comments against those who work for God. Mm. And what are we planting in the heads of people? Mm. When time of trouble comes, when uh, the time comes where we really need the, the spirit of God to be amongst us, we will actually realize that we have far more removed it. And there is nothing that we will be able to do. So let us be careful in what we tell people. Let us be careful when we think that we are fighting just someone. Let alone we are just fighting the spirit of God. My next quotation says... Oh, okay, I'm getting to my next one. Number six. Okay. All right, you can do that. Okay, thanks. Thank you, sweetie. Um, you know, Oop Dwake is saying, hey, marriage is not an achievement. Without attacking anyone, God has blessed the marriage institution and they will help us in it. And <laughs> this is he's saying, I was about to say this, great minds mm -hmm. do think alike. Fantastic. Yeah, you know, whether it's an achievement or not, but the attitude that we have towards it is really being affected. And you know, by beholding, we are being changed. The more we hear the news that, ah, oh, Bill Gates has divorced, or they are planning to divorce, and then they know they are not, hey, she's an entanglement, hey, she's that. Over time, the sanctity of the institution is lost, like Uncle Libs was saying. So may God really help us, even though sometimes these um, phrases are spoken jokingly, sometimes they are not, they get into our heads and have a tendency to dilute us, you know? So may God really help us to... Um, make note of this and be deliberate about protecting the avenues of our hearts so i'll go back to number six which i skipped which is saying here that um when the news of the massacre so this is the massacre at saint bartholomew um reached rome the exaltation among the clergy knew no bounds the cardinal of lorraine rewarded the messenger with a thousand crowns um and the canon had sent Angelo thundered forth a joyous salute and bells rang out from every steeple. Um, bonfires turned night into day and Gregory the 13th attended the cardinals and other ecclesiastical dignitaries went in a long procession to the church um, of St. Louis. You know what this is talking about is what I mentioned um, earlier that people were slaughtered. Now the background to this slaughter I found it to be very interesting is that um, there, were, there were ongoing wars, right? So I'll first read what I wrote here. This happened in 15, 1572, and it was as a result of Catholic mob violence versus the Huguenots. So the Huguenots were French Calvinists. Remember, we learned about Calvin, John Calvin, remember? Whom we say some of his ideas were a bit lost, but he was a, a, a reformer nonetheless. So... There were ongoing series of wars between the reformers or the Protestants and the Catholics. And so in 1570, at um, St. German, a, a pact is signed and they say, ah, you know what, there's going to be peace, we won't kill each other. So in 1572 now, the queen, who was called Catherine, then sanctioned that um, my daughter should marry the prince who was later to become... Um, King Henry of France. So she said, ah, my daughter should marry the prince, and then the prince, it would be a union between Protestantism and Catholicism. But the Catholics were not happy about it. So people had come for the wedding on 18 August, and then on 22 August, for the seven days, this is when the massacre began. So people that were in Paris, the great controversy says that those that were in their homes in Paris which suggests that there were also reformers, but Protestants, but we're not as open about it, who were living in France, because France was largely Catholic, who were living in Paris, I mean, Paris, who were largely um, Catholic. So these guys were now killed, and the massacre went on, and in fact, it went over to other cities. So people went unexpected, they thought, hi, the king has said it's okay, he will take care of us. 
but in the whatever of the king that had plighted these people were killed and so excuse me what this says to me is when there's deception and one party is deceptive if we choose to follow a deceptive person in the end the innocent usually suffers you know if a deceptive boyfriend says let's go to my house you want to read the bible but you know the type of person he is don't go you are the one who is going to be devoured you are the one who will suffer that's why we actually don't have the you can that we don't unite with because of that once there is that unity we love them they are our brothers and sisters and the problem is just the institution but we know that because the character of the devil has been a deceptive one chances are high that he might deceive us so may god help us to realize that what changes is just the form the form of deception so sometimes it might be a serpent that talks to eve sometimes it might be a pope sometimes it might be your cell phone but the deception is there and it's just the means that has been changed sweetie mm -hmm. um the next quotation said um little did the rulers of the land foresee the results of that faithful policy mm -hmm. the teaching of the bible would have impact, implanted in the minds and hearts of the people those principles of justice temperance truth equity and benevolence which are the very cornerstone of a nation's prosperity Righteousness exalted a nation, thereby the throne is established. Uh, Proverbs 14, verse 34. I think it goes without um, saying to say, um, when someone really loves God, that person is a nice person. We actually have expectations from those who say we follow God. Mm -hmm. We expect them to be nice people, to be generous, and a lot of things. So when we are saying let's remove God, from our nation, what are we saying? Let's remove those who do good. We don't want to be good in this nation. Uh, I've seen even uh, leaders of nations, even at work, they give time to say we need uh, someone to pray for us. Because each and every one of us appreciates uh, the goodness that comes from following the, uh, the Lord. Mm -hmm. But now, when these leaders were actually agreeing to say, let us uh, agree that there is no God. What were they saying? Mm -hmm. um, my call is to us to say, when we go for a day without prayer, when we go for a day without teaching our children about Jesus Christ, what are we trying to achieve? We are just saying our children should learn from YouTube, Facebook, or even from their friends. And what are we doing? We are just leading them to be like the French here, where they will their hearts will be drawn away from Jesus Christ. They will not learn to have a good habit. Mm. So if we want people to have good habits wherever we are, wherever we think we have influence, let us not remove the word of God. Mm. Let us give people the word of God so much. If someone is going to have a heart of giving up, of um, actually doing good to others, they need the word of God to do that. We will see some of the things that our nations complain about these days to say, there are people who are very rich, who are taking away from the poor. That is one thing that happened during the French Revolution, even if you read about it. The gap between the poor and the rich was just going. People are massing well at the advantage of others. We see it in every country, where people always complain to say, you know, we're getting poorer and poorer. Unemployment itself, I'll read another quotation. Unemployment was very high. People who were actually begging in the streets were high. Aren't we seeing that same thing? What's really happening? It's those little things that we are doing, neglecting the word of God. Mm. Let your family or yourself not be caught in that, where you move away from God. Because before you know it, trouble will be uh, around you. I will move on to the next quotation. Uh, you, is it the one that you give? Yes, this one and this one. Yeah, I um, Okay, so the next one is saying that at last ruin of the state was complete. There remained no more conscience to be proscribed, no more religion to be dragged to the stake, no more patriotism to be chased into banishment. You know, what is being said is when people had um, 
had killed the reformers. Initially, remember, they were killing the reformers on the stake, right? So there was no more um, reformers to burn on the stake, and there was no more conscience to be prescribed. So there was no one who was saying, no, what you're doing is wrong. The voice of reproof was scarcely heard. And now what happened was that they had to extinguish each other. You know, it's so much in our own lives. I was just thinking in our own lives how often we silence the Holy Spirit such that there is nothing more that the Holy Spirit can say to you. He has tried over and over and over and over again. A time is coming when that voice is going to be extinguished. May it not be our portion to say we are going to allow the voice of the Holy Spirit to be silenced in our life. Because what results, the results of that are anarchy and chaos as seen in France. So this reminded me of the quotation that I shared with you last time from the book The Desire of Ages, which says that even though the wicked do not know it, they owe all the blessings that they enjoy to the presence of the righteous mm. in their communities. So here, there was no one else left who was righteous. They had died. The righteous had died. They had fled to the mountains. They had fled to German and surrounding countries. Others had even fled to Africa, mm. as we would learn. So now... There was no voice of reason in that community. There was no light to shine because they themselves had killed the righteous that existed. Are you not killing the little dot of righteousness that's left in you such that there's nothing to respond to the warnings of God because it has fled and said, uh -uh, I can't stay in Mara, I I'm done, I, I just need to go. And what is going to result, the sure result of that is anarchy. So I thought of what Uncle Libs was talking about as well, that it is said that the best citizens of any nation should be Christians. With the exception of the time when we know that legislation is going to be passed, that is contrary to the word of God. When that happens, obviously we're going to say it is better to obey God rather than men. But on anything else, remember our obedience to God is based on love. You don't fear the consequences saying, if I lie, if I have a boyfriend right now, I don't fear to say, what if Uncle Libs catches me? My fear should be, ah, okay, what does God say about this, you know? My fear should be, how is this affecting my relationship with God? So, because we have the ability to love and obey God based on choice, a law that actually mandates to say you should do this or else you'll be thrown in prison should be easier for us to keep. Therefore, it is easier for Christians to be law-abiding citizens. More so because our example is God who says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. But when Caesar requires the things of God, then most certainly we will choose to worship God. So I'm going to read the, um, something from... Okay. Uh, Daisy is saying from Adventist home the chapter that says God in the avenues of our souls it talks about exposing kids to outside influence so Sister White actually says even newspapers are harmful to them so we should daily feed our kids with heavenly things only mm. you know <laughs> it's quite interesting Daisy I was sharing with Uncle Lee that ha huh, my uh, my Facebook, um, I think I've told you guys before, if I haven't, that's fine. I was saying, I'll that. My Facebook feed, huh? I'm constantly getting these things about marriage, like the different forms of marriages that are coming right now. And I was thinking, should I get to know about them? There is polyamorous, what, what, and these marriages. And I was thinking, okay, should I even get to know about them? Because sometimes I think, ah, okay, so maybe I should just know and be informed. But I think of the effect that come, that it does on my heart, in my mind. And then I told him of the verse that says, whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is honorable. That should be your guiding principle. So when you look at something, you, the first thing you start, ah, okay, is this true? Hmm? Okay, so maybe it's a movie. Is it a true movie? Is it something that happens, right? Starting point, whatever is true, is it right? What I'm watching, is it right? That I'm allowing my heart to feast on. Is it something that's right? Something that I want to become flesh in me. Remember the Bible says, when your words came, I ate them and thy word became flesh in me. So that means whatever you eat, whether you read it, you watch it, 
you consume it and be, it becomes a part of you, right? So is it true? Is it right? And then is it honorable? Well, people look at me and say, oh, fantastic, this is honorable. We give thanks and glory to God. And the response to that was no. So I chose not to really know about it. But ah, it's, it's overwhelming, you know, with everything. The kids have TikTok, they have YouTube. <sighs> Sad, man. Anyway, Uncle Liz, I think you have the next one. Um, the next one says, Paris became one vast almhouse, house, and it is estimated that at the breaking out of the revolution, mm -hmm. 200,000 paupers claimed charity from the hands of him. Um, this is what I was saying to say, those days, unemployment was very high. People chose not to follow God, but at the same time, it had effects. Many people were now relying from um, handouts. I, I can't say really what's happening is because of evilness. But I think we can actually agree to say even before COVID, the number of people who have been taking those drugs, I think it's concerning even in our own country. Where a lot of youths are unemployed, they're taking drugs, they're doing a lot of things even in the streets, you can actually see them. And I can hear in other countries, people claiming for charity. There are a lot of people. Those things only indicate how bad things will be. And indicates that there is something bad that is about to happen. We might not know when or whenever. People cannot continue, cannot continue just begging. Because those who are giving, if they stop, it means these people would think that uh, maybe they should be given. They will actually revolt against these people. Or they will actually point to something. Uh, if we read the prophets, we will we'll actually see that when people are troubled and troubled again, mm -hmm. they will actually end up saying, you know what, maybe these are the people who are causing our troubles, the Christians or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we should actually see these things. When we read about the French Revolution, when we look at what was happening then, we should know what... Um, we, 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 we learn history. So that you can shape our future. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing that actually uh, shocked me to say. Some of the things that were happening at this time, they are still happening right now. And they are actually getting worse. So let us pray to God and let us always stay um, near God. So that when things happen, when the days are evil, we will always uh, be saved from the evilness. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take your next one. Oh, I, I, I have the next one. Yeah. The next one says, But under the domination of Rome, the people had lost the Savior's blessed lesson of self-sacrifice and unselfish love. They had been led away from the practice of self-denial for the good of others. The rich had found no rebuke for their oppression of the poor. The poor no help for their servitude and degradation. Uh, so, what, what we learn from this quotation is, no one was telling the rich who were oppressing the poor to say, no, what you are doing is wrong. If you even look in the Bible, even the Jewish culture, Jesus, when he was preaching, he was always telling people to look at others. But selfishness now was uh, ripe. Everywhere you could see people were trying just to amass well for themselves. And that's exactly what's happening these days. I always tell Mara to say, when I open my, even my Facebook, my Google, uh, you, the, news. the news is always talking about how you can amass wealth for yourself. doesn't talk about how you can help others. And that should only show us that we are living in the days that are very dangerous. The last uh, quotation before I give to Mara says... Sorry, mm. I think just get to your... The ones that you want. I'm leaving those ones. Okay. Because it's now 4 o'clock on the door. Okay, I'll just read the one... Uh, one of my last quotations um, actually these are self-explanatory my last two quotations the, to the warnings of his counselors the kings okay uh, this one that I mentioned uh, early in here in the introduction so my last quotation will come from the very last uh, paragraph of the chapter whatever is built upon the authority of men will be overthrown mm -hmm. but that which is founded upon the rock of god's immutable word shall stand forever mm -hmm. this is what we should always uh, remember even laws laws if they are passed which go against what we believe or what god has told us 
we should know that it will pass. But what God has taught us, what God has told us, that this is what can sustain people. This is what can sustain human beings. We should always tend to eat. Whilst the nations, whilst our cultures are changing, telling us that marriage or fearing God is something that's no longer awake. We should know that those are made-made uh, things. But what works is what God uh, blessed uh, at the beginning of the world. Uh, we'll live on to Mara. Okay, so my last quotation reads, When error in one gab had been detected, Satan only must eat in a different disguise, and multitudes receive it eagerly, as at the first. When the people found Romanism to be a deception, and he could not through this agency lead them to, trans, to, to transgression of God's law. He urged them to regard all religion as a cheat and the Bible as a fable. And casting aside the divine statutes, they gave themselves up for unbridled iniquity. The fatal error which wrought such war to the inhabitants of France was ignoring this one great truth that freedom lies between the proscriptions of the law of God. You know what this quotation is saying to me is, the devil, I was listening to a presentation which was saying, the devil is a deceiver when he's tamed as a serpent, when he's tamed as a dragon, he's a destroyer, and then when he's tamed as a beast, I've forgotten what for beast is, there were three that were given, and it was a presentation by Pastor Skeet. So Pastor Skeet was talking of how these different things are the means that the devil employs to this. Oh, and then when he's Satan, he's the accuser of brethren. So when he's in heaven, he says, and there was, when he's Lucifer, then Satan, he says that he's an accuser of the brethren. So it says, what do you on earth for the accuser of the saints has been thrown down to you, right? What this says to me is the devil has so many different forms that he can take and use and employ to deceive us. We have to be on the lookout to be able to identify, but not only identify and spend time trying to say, oh, okay, so that's the devil. Oh, okay, so the devil is doing that. Rather, we should spend more time on noticing what the word of God says. By knowing what the word of God says, whatever tactic, as long as it is contrary to the pure, thus says the Lord, then we know that it's the devil. Because remember, there are only two sources. So if God has said A, and someone comes saying B, then you know that it's not God, it's not the same source, and it's obvious, it's the devil. So this is what France felt to discern that, even though they said, ah, Romanism, it's not it, it's like the worst. They then said, so all religion, and they painted it black. But God wanted them to notice that the deceiver had just changed the tactic, but he was still the same person. And so this is the French Revolution. You know, guys, in conclusion, I want to say this is quite interesting. And this helps us notice that Jesus has said he's coming again. The first Jesus who instructed John and gave him knowledge with regards to the French Revolution. We can trust the word that he's given. His promise is sure. It enforces the fact that we have Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 reinforcing the same point. When... Nebuchadnezzar dreams of that statue and the Lord reveals the future. He also revealed that there is a rock that's coming. So the French Revolution happened and it was a point where everything that happened in the society changed. Because remember the rights also changed the moral fabric of the world at large. You have Zimbabwe also crying for human rights. You have countries that probably at that point Voltaire never thought would exist. That cried for the same. So the chaos or disaster that's about to come in our time is also going to change the trajectory of the world. We need to be prepared to say, Lord, this is what is going to happen. But on which side we will be, it is entirely up to us. Remember, God says that the decision in the end is up to you. God has said that there are people who are going to choose God. There are going to be people who are against God. The choice to choose God or be against God is you, is yours. This is condemnation. That light came into the world. But men loved darkness rather than light. God does not condemn where light has not been given. For anything that you have no ability to know and what God has not revealed to you, you will not be condemned. 
But if God has revealed to you and there are truths that you keep saying, ah, oh, nah, I won't do it. May God help us to bend for deal with God. That was our lesson for today. And we are done. Thank you so much for joining us live, guys. You know, most people were just watching after church and everything. So we really appreciate you for creating time to join us live. May God bless you. We'll be praying for you during the week. And hopefully we'll meet you again next Sabbath. Okay? So if you have any prayer requests, that's fine. Feel free to type them. I will wait for a minute. If not, um, we will pray. Okay. Yeah, sure okay. network was yeah. given this side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like he was writing about network. That's fine. All right. Ten. Mm-hmm. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Hmm. Okay. So I will pray. Let's pray. Our kind and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy. We thank you that you care for us and you want us to really know um, what is happening and what will happen in the world. You have given us the Bible, Lord. Give us strength to study it. Our walk with you is not easy. Christianity is such um, a difficult thing to practice in this day and age. You know, there are so many forces pulling us left, right, and we don't know how exactly we're supposed to do things. May you help us. May you show us what we're supposed to do. Be the one to reveal how we ought to live our lives. At the end of the day, Jesus, we ask that you may help us to be more like Jesus and to prepare for your soon coming. May we share with our friends that you're coming very, very soon. This is our humble prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Okay, Uputwake is saying thank God for life. Indeed, we did that. So, you want to thank God. That's fine. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week. And have a great week. Hope the families are good and everyone is okay. Okay? Uh Bye.